Would you turn your Bibles with me tonight, please, to two passages of Scripture? I think we'll be very familiar to you. The Lord is in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. The other is in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Everybody got it? Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Let's read that in verse, shall we? The scripture says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 8, let's look at what the scripture says here. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Father, I ask you tonight that you were just blessed, sir. If nothing else, just the sheer reading, the looking at the Word of God. Thank you for the song that was sung as they touched our heart. The last one, Father, goes along with what we want to talk about here tonight. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will give us clear thought clear words that all of our hearts will be touched by the person of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This week I have been reading and studying on the subject of grace. And down to the years, I don't know how many people have said something like, well, preacher, you know, my sins weren't all that bad. I mean, I got saved when I was 14. I mean, come on, be honest with me, preacher. How much sin could a person commit in just 14 years? And I've heard, I guess, probably, I'm not going to say every excuse in the book, because I'm old enough to realize when I make that kind of statement, then somebody comes along and, and gives me something new that I hadn't heard before. But I am going to say that I guess I've heard a lot, and perhaps I think you do as well. But I found here in this verse something quite amazing. I've been looking and reading on the subject of grace. I found that scholars tell us that it seems from the teaching of scriptures that the greatest attribute of God is the fact that He is pure holiness. So much so that nobody can approach Him. But out of His holiness, I've heard scholars say that these other attributes are right there with this attribute of holiness. And in His grace, His grace that flows from His holiness because the Scriptures declares that He is also equally love. When I begin to research this a little bit, I'll be honest with you, it, it goes so deep that this morning I had to just sit there and just ponder over what I have read. My mind is not able to plumb the depths of this subject. Nor have I ever read of anybody who could. Even the Apostle Paul could not figure all of this out. And I don't think anybody can because our God is so so high and exalted and lifted up 
that if it were not for the fact that He sent down His love, through His grace, you would not know anything about Him. But let me say this to you. Have you ever heard that little song that He sent down His love on the wings of a dove? Well, say what you will, but the fact remains that He sent down His grace and love in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And ladies and gentlemen, He, more than anybody, revealed the Father to us in such a way that even a child can believe. But what I notice when I put these two verses together is that God's grace, once it comes into a person's life, places desires deep down within that person that this person within himself longs to do for the Lord. These desires are so deep in him or her that at times they cannot even speak to the Lord about what they really want to do for him. It is so deep in their life that only the Holy Spirit can plumb into the depths of that and relate it to the Father. You say, well, preacher, where does these desires come from? They stem out of the love and grace of God that has been deposited in that Christian's life <clears throat> and enables that Christian to have a desire so deeply rooted in him to please the Lord, to honor the Lord, to see to it that his name is lifted up and exalted that if it were not for the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit of God within us, they would never get uttered to the Father. That shows me that they're working in absolute total unity to bring about His will and for your good pleasure and the desires that you have in your heart to honor Him, to exalt Him, to love Him, and to please Him. Someone asked me years ago, Preacher, how do you please God? Well, the Bible tells us clearly in several places, and, and one of them tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And when that faith mixed with that grace, mixed with these desires, mixed with the Holy Spirit, interpreting the, those desires to the Father in our behalf because we don't know how to do it, friend, things happen things happen. So I want to ask you tonight, what kind of deep-seated desire is lodged so deep in your heart that you've not shared it with anybody for fear that they may mock you, look at you and say, you, you, you've got to be crazy. Man, there's no way you're going to be able to, to pull that off or to do this or anything else. But let me share something with you. When real faith acts upon the desires in your heart to honor God with your life, nothing is outside of the realm of the possible with Almighty God. God can see that desire and He does. He knows what's in your heart. I was talking with a lady just about a week ago and I shared with her a deep desire in my heart. It's been there for a long, long time. And she looked at me and she said, well, Pastor, all I want to say to you about that is this, that God knows your heart's desire. Amen. And I want to tell you, I took courage in that statement because it came from a lady's mouth who I believe her heart is surrendered to the Lord. That she loves God and wants to honor her, Him with her life. And I took encouragement from hearing that from her into my ears. I want to ask you tonight, do you still believe that whatever it is that's in your heart that you really like to do for Him, <coughs> Do you still believe that He's able to pull it off? You still believe that? 
Do you believe tonight that God can take your desires along with others and put them in their proper place and build something great that started with you? Last night I went home and I sat down to watch the news and all and, and uh, Deb had been playing a CD that I'd like to play here. And she said, there's things on here you're not going to believe. And it's Kirk Cameron talking about how this nation got founded. And how he went all the way back to England and to Holland and found that the original people who came to this country came to honor God. And on the Mayflower, they wrote the Mayflower Compact that you don't hear much about anymore. And revealed how hardships that they went through just to come. They were losing their life. King James of England, the one who forced them to write the Bible in English under his leadership, bankrupt his country, were killing Christians left and right. All because they read the scriptures for themselves and denounced the Church of England and said, we will believe God and God only. And that marked them. And I sat there and I watched that program and I thought to myself, that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing that these people did not give up. Separated from their wives and children for over a year finally were reunited and when they got here, by the time they got here, most of the women in that first year or the only ship here died. Most of those women died laying over their children to try to keep them warm through the harsh winter months. You know why they did that? Because they had had a desire in their heart. And here it is. This is amazing. To come here found a nation to grow in numbers and strength and return to England and leave their home country out of spiritual darkness. That's incredible. Amen. That's incredible. Let me ask you a question. Could God use that desire that you have to birth something into existence that would defy all odds, make those who are live in a negative world sit up and take notice and say, that must have been of God. Amen. What I'm trying to say to you tonight is don't give up on your dreams. If God has placed them there, Take them one at a time and let him work with them. I'll never forget reading the story behind Howard Hendricks' conversion to Christ. And how that a Sunday school teacher started a class, rounded up 12 little boys and began to teach them about the love of God. One of those little boys was the great Bible teacher, Howard Hendricks who went on to pour his life into people like Chuck Swindoll, Tony Evans, David Jeremiah, and a host of others that have circled the globe with the gospel of Jesus Christ. All because of one little Sunday school teacher, one man somewhere who had a desire in his heart so deep that when he tried to pray about it, he couldn't utter to God what he really wanted God to accomplish through him. But God, through his spirit, heard him and raised up some giants of the faith who have been responsible for causing millions of people to come to faith and grow in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at that verse where it said, For God is love. The only reason you're sitting here tonight is because God placed His love in your heart. Amen. Through His grace, because He's so holy, 
that he knew you couldn't come to him, so he came to you. Hallelujah. Amen. So hold on to your dreams and believe that God can use you to accomplish them. Father, I thank you tonight for the precious Word of God. And I pray that these two passages and the others that I have quoted and mentioned will find a deep lodging place within all of our hearts and help us, Lord Jesus, to hold on to that dream and believe by faith that, God, you put it there and you will bring it to pass. For we pray in Christ's name, amen.